prayer as we turn to the Word of God. Our Father, how we praise you this morning that Jesus loves us. Yes, I know, for the Bible tells me so. And Father, we want to pray this morning for the boys and girls who've been amongst us. We just look at them, Father, and our hearts go out in deep sympathy to them. In that, in that, Father, they're being brought up in a world which is so different to the world that I was brought up in and many of their parents were brought up in. And seems that the powers of Satan are, are, are rampant against our little ones. We ask, Father, that every one of them might come to know Jesus as their Savior. And as they grow up, Father, that there'll be a body of children in this place whose hearts the Lord has touched and that there will be an effective witness through the children of this place and the young people, and that there will be a work done for eternity. But Father, we come just now that we're going to read your holy word, and we ask that your Holy Spirit might minister to us and do his ministry. And I pray that you would please enlighten our minds, but Lord, also that you will give us that willing spirit so that our wills might be willing to be conformed to your will. And that as a result of our gathering this morning, oh, Father, that we'll go away from this place more like the Lord Jesus and rejoicing in the fact that we're in the Lord Jesus and that he is our Savior and our friend. So, Father, take control, please, and bless this meeting, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're turning in our books, please, in our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3, we're just going to read the first four verses of the passage of the chapter, and then we're going to look at some things within it. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 1. <clears throat> Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who hath built the house hath more glory than the house. For every house is builded by some man, but he that built all things is God. May God bless to us that reading from his precious word. The book of Hebrews was written to Christians who had been dispersed from Jerusalem at the time of Stephen's persecution. And they had gone different places, but sadly they had gone, and where they had gone there was great persecution again had arisen amongst them. And they were sadly in need of great encouragement. One of the problems was, you see, that they hadn't grown in their Christian faith. They had remained static or retarded in their Christian faith. If you read cha chapter 5 and the few verses there, you'll discover that when they should have been teachers, they were needing someone to teach them again the fundamentals of the faith. But dear friends, one of the symptoms of this uh, retardation in their Christian growth is something which may be even evident today, because I think it is a universal thing. One of the things that give evidence that they were not growing was that they weren't attending the prayer meetings. They weren't attending the Bible studies. And the exhortation was that they were not to forsake the assembling of themselves together as the manner of some was, because that was holding them back. And they weren't growing as they weren't being fed, and that they needed to know more about their salvation. Because, friends, salvation is not just a one-off experience. That's only the beginning, the entrance into a wonderful experience, which is a lifetime experience with the Lord Jesus Christ. But even though they had been in lack of progress, Paul greets them in this first verse. He says, ye are holy brethren. Ye are partakers of a heavenly calling. And then he says to them, now you folks, I want you to consider, I want you to consider the apostle and high priest of, of your profession, Christ Jesus. The apostle and high priest. Here's two ministries which were focused in the Lord Jesus Christ, and yet they were very, very different from each other. You could actually say that Christ's first ministry as the apostle and his second ministry as the high priest took him in completely opposite directions. Took him in completely opposite directions. You see, as the apostle of our profession, the Lord Jesus came from being with God to being with men. And an apostle is a sent person. 
Don't be reading Galatians 4 that when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that they might receive the adoption of sons. And when the Lord Jesus Christ came, he lived a sinless life. He died an atoning death. He was buried and raised again from the dead. And then the Lord Jesus Christ, after that, he went from being a man amongst men to being a man with God. And so being the apostle, he came from God to man. And being the high priest, he's gone from man back to God again. And it seems to me, dear friends, that it was after the finished work on the cross that these two ministries which centered in the Lord Jesus Christ were exchanged. Because we read in Peter's epistle, for Christ hath once suffered for has suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened in the spirit. Then at the end of that chapter, it says, having gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject to him. When the Lord Jesus Christ finished his course as God's apostle, the risen Savior is now engaged in his unfinished work in the heaven for us as our great high priest, representing us who are saved before his Father. Can I say something to young people who are here this morning? And friends, I've been trying to encourage our young people to take notes. Take notes in meetings. I think back to my days, early days as a young Christian, and I think of the the material that I heard, but I never wrote down, and how I really regret that thing. But here's something for the young people. When we become Christians, the Savior enters into a threefold relationship with us. The Savior's He is our Savior. He is our high priest, and he is our head. You see, as our Savior, my salvation relates to the past, to the time when he redeemed us, and when he delivered us from the penalty of sin and from the powers of darkness. And because we received the Lord Jesus Christ by faith and believed in his name, we can say, Dear Savior, thou art mine. How sweet the thought to me. Let me repeat thy name and lift my heart to thee. Mine, 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 I know thou art mine. That's our relationship as him as our Savior. But the Lord Jesus Christ's relation to us as his high priest, you see, having saved us, we go on to learn and to appreciate that he is our high priest in heaven. And it means we can not only say that he is mine, but I am his. I am his. I am his, dear friends. And this is a precious truth to grasp, because it means that I am his responsibility. It is as our high priest we hear him say, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. It's as my high priest I hear him say, my grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. And so you see, not only is he is mine, but I am his. And then our third relationship is that of head, headship. Because when we become Christians, not only can we say he is mine and I am his, but we can say that he and I are one forever. One forever, dear friends. His forever, only his. Who the Lord and me shall part. Ah, with what a rest of bliss Christ can fill the loving heart. Heaven and earth may fade and flee. Firstborn light and dim decline. But while God and I shall be, I am his and he is mine. And doesn't the apostle, he reiterates that in Romans chapter 8. He says, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. You see, it's not possible to divide between the body and the head or else the whole thing becomes an organism which is destroyed. And you and I who are in Christ We need to remember that we're no longer, dear friends, just a collection of individuals. We're members of the body of Christ, and we're sealed by the Holy Spirit. But let's go on and think about these two ministries together, because here we have him as our great high priest. I wonder, did you ever ask yourself the question, why was it absolutely essential for the Lord Jesus 
before he could become high priest, to become God's apostle, and uh, to suffer many things? Well, it's a good question, and it's an important question. I want you to turn with me. We're looking at Hebrews. Now, we're not going to leave the book of Hebrews. But if you just go over to chapter 4 and verses 14 and 15, and here are two key verses. You see, we have an high priest that has passed into the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession, for we have not an high priest that cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Now, when you look at those verses initially and superficially, you might be tempted to think that they simply teach us where the Lord Jesus Christ is today. He's in the heavens. However, the way the words are there, dear friends, it should cause us to consider not only where he is, but how did he get there? How did he get there? He passed into the heavens. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ, to be an effective as our great high priest, to be the one who was able to sympathize and to empathize with us, he had to pass the way that we are now passing. He had to understand it, you see. And that's why it was necessary, so that he could be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. Why was it absolutely essential for Jesus to become a man? to suffer the abuse and be despised and rejected of men before he died? What were the qualities that the sinless, spotless Son of God lacked uh, so that he could become God's apostle and die as the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world? Why did he have to endure the contradiction of sinners against himself in order that his ongoing ministry in heaven could be effective? Well, in order for the Lord Jesus Christ to become God's Lamb, he had to become a man. He had to become a man. Just flick forward to chapter 2 in Hebrews. In fact, in chapter 2 of Hebrews, we read in verse 14, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. Why? That through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil and deliver them who through the fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. You see, beloved, as death, eh, Jesus couldn't die. He knew about death, but he never experienced death. And death was the price that God required to be paid for a man's sin. And if Jesus had never become a man, he could never have qualified to be our kinsman redeemer. And we read in chapter 2, 17, it behoved him to be made like unto his brethren that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest. You see, it was being made like unto his brethren and living as a man amongst man that Jesus learned obedience to the things that he suffered and was made perfect. Now you say, hold on a minute. He was made perfect. Well, we read that in chapter 5 and, and verses 8 and 9. But we must be careful never to think that the Lord Jesus Christ ever passed from a state of imperfection to a state of being made perfect. What is simply in view here is this, dear friends, that through his human sufferings and through his persecutions as a man, the Lord Jesus became complete in the human experience. What a precious thought that ought to be to us. Here we are trying to live for him in this present evil world. But to know, dear friends, that in spite of the difficulties, there's a man in the glory today, Christ Jesus, and he's representing us in the presence of the Father. He has passed the way that we are now passing. He knows all about our struggles. And that's why we read, for he, we have not an high priest that cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, was with the feeling of our infirmity. When, when Jesus was here as God's apostle amongst men, he voluntarily subjected himself to every sinless human weakness common to man. My, but these were previously unknown to him. Did you ever think about that? You think, for example, at Syker's Well, the Lord Jesus Christ became weary in the journey. Now, he would have known that there was weariness, but he'd never experienced weariness. 
And, and so, in order to become perfected as a man, he had to learn what weariness was. When he was in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted of the devil, we read there that he was unhungered. He knew that there was hunger, but he'd never experienced it for himself in the human context. When he went to Lazarus's tomb, you remember that Jesus wept. Oh, he knew about death and he knew about bereavement, but here he learned about the pain of bereavement as a man. And when he was hung on the cross, he cried, I thirst. Yes, friends, he knew that there was thirst in the world, but he'd never experienced thirst, and so he had to go through these experiences as a man. And while he was here upon earth, Jesus lived subject to every human infirmity. And now that he's in glory, there's not a pang that rends my heart, but the man of glory has a part. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Isn't that an encouragement today, dear friends? Because I'm sure there were times in all of our lives when circumstances crowd in upon us, and we can't see to the end of the tunnel. We, we can't even realize and we can't appreciate there's a light at the end of the tunnel. But it's in times like that, you see, when we're tempted to wonder, does Jesus care about our situation? I want to assure he does care. He is a merciful and he's a faithful high priest. And he does care. And the hymn writer got the truth correct. He says, does Jesus care when my heart is pained? Does Jesus care when my way is dark? Does Jesus care when I've tried and failed? Does Jesus care when I've said goodbye to the dearest on earth to me? Oh, yes, he cares. I know he cares. His heart is touched with my grief. When the days are weary, the long nights dreary, I know my Savior cares. Oh, beloved, be assured. Our Lord Jesus Christ he is our representative in the presence of God. And he has passed the way that you and I are passing today. And therefore, he is touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Oh, this is important, dear friends. Let's just gather it up for a moment. Because as we consider the Lord Jesus as our great high priest, surely it will prevent us from becoming weary and faint in our mind. This word, consider Christ, you see, is something that Paul put in right at the beginning. We've just finished the introduction in the first two chapters, and now he's starting his theme, and he says, consider Christ. When we get to the end of the book, in chapter 12, he's just gone through all that great, great list of people of faith. And he comes to chapter 12, and he says, consider Christ. Consider Christ. Consider them, consider him in all that he's done, and consider him in what he has endured, lest ye become weary and faint in your mind. Because he has gone a step further, and he has paid the ultimate price, and he's gone to the cross. He's the one that leads us in paths of righteousness. Consider Christ, friends. Oh, yes. My, how we need to turn our eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And remember this, that the Lord Jesus Christ, knowing all about our struggles, uh, knowing all about the things that we're going through, he, my, he never asks us to do anything that he has never done, and he never asks us to go anywhere or to pass through anything through which he has never passed. And it was because Jesus became a man. He himself suffered being tempted in all points as we are. And that's why he understands the depth of our temptation, and he also understands the degree of our weaknesses. My, what a Savior. And it's because he has passed into the heavens that we are assured of a sympathetic hearing and understanding when we come boldly to the throne of grace where we can obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now, up to this moment, we have actually been considering the fact that Jesus has passed into the heavens and the way in which he has passed. But what exactly is he doing in the heavens? What exactly is Jesus doing in the heavens? Well, in chapter 8 and verse 1, we read these words. We have such an high priest 
who is set at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Get those words. The right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. And they should grip us, dear friends. There is that sense of majesty and sovereignty and authority in his position. And as God's apostle, he has been placed there. You see, when he came to earth, when he came to earth as the apostle, Jesus came to the lowest place that earth could give him. He came to a manger in Bethlehem. But that was only the start of the downward journey. Whilst he was moving about and ministering as a man amongst men, he says, The foxes of holes, the birds of the air of nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And yet that was nothing to what lay ahead of him. Because his earthly journey ultimately ended on the cross, even the death of the cross, where Jesus was identified with the lowest of the low in this world. Because we read, Cursed is every one that hangeth upon a tree. However, having finished the work that the Father had given him to do, God raised him from the dead. God received him back into heaven. And then we see a contrast between the earth's appreciation of the Savior and heaven's appreciation. The only time earth lifted up the Savior was when they hung him on the old rugged cross. That's the only time he was lifted up on earth. But in heaven, they hailed him as a sovereign, my, they healed him as a sovereign. And our Lord, his position exudes power and glory and authority. And now, dear friends, he's seated in the highest seat in the universe. The highest seat that heaven affords is his by sovereign right. As King of kings and Lord of lords, he reigns in perfect light. Now, having established his position, we just think for a moment or two about his purpose. First of all, the Lord Jesus Christ seemed to me to have three main purposes in heaven, three main priestly ministries, and the first of these is as a mediator. You see, this is a ministry that relates to sinners. A mediator is someone who comes between two opposing parties, and he endeavors to bridge the gap between them. He endeavors to bring a state of reconciliation and harmony between them. Now, you and I were all born in sin. And because of that, there's an infinite gap between us and our holy God. And the Lord Jesus Christ came as a mediator. And when he died on the cross, he bridged the gap between sinful man and a holy God. And it was on Calvary, by the shedding of his precious blood, that he opened up a way whereby you and I can be brought near to God, reconciled to God through the death of His Son. Let me just pause for a moment, please. Because if you're not saved this morning, really, a lot of what I've been saying isn't relevant to you. It isn't. If you've never been born again, whatever you might think about yourself, and that can be a lot, you see, when people talk about being saved, well, uh, some people think in their minds, they begin to think, well, I'm just as good as the other person, uh, uh, and I don't see why I need to be saved. Let me tell you something about your mind, dear friends. Your mind is blinded by the devil. It's blinded by the devil in case the light of the glorious gospel of Christ should shine in. You maybe think this morning, well, I'm a religious person, and I'm all right. I go to my church, I pay into it, and I do all that's necessary. But, dear friends, let me tell you this. That's no good for salvation. Salvation is not of works, religious works, or any other kind of works. And you might say, well, of course, I must be part of God's found people. I'm one of God's children because I have been baptized, or I've been confirmed, or, or I, I attended Sunday school, and, and, and I've been attending a Baptist church. I must be one of God's children. Friend, if that's how your mind is thinking, let me tell you, your mind is at enmity with God because God's Word teaches us that the only way that you can become one of God's children is by receiving the Lord Jesus Christ personally and intellectually and spiritually. It's to as many as receive him gives he the right to be called the children of God. 
And if you haven't been saved, if you've never received Christ, dear friend, you're not a child of God. You're like those religious people that Jesus spoke to. He said to them, now, if, if you really believed in me, you would do the things I say, but because you don't do that, you're of your father, the devil. If you're not saved this morning, friend, that's your situation. But I'm glad to be able to tell you that in spite of your sin, in spite of your pride, uh, God loves you. And God sent His Son into this world as His apostle to die on the old rugged cross, to open up a way back to Himself from the dark paths of sin, so that you need not perish. If you believe in Him and receive Him as your Savior, my, you'll become one of God's children, and you'll be on your way to the Father's house where Jesus is making a preparation for all who trust Him. I tell you, friend, you need to be saved. If you're going to get to heaven, you need to be saved. There's a philosophy abroad today that there are many ways to heaven. Uh, you know, it's like climbing a mountain, some people would say. I think that's what the Masons say. It's like climbing a mountain. And everybody's gone up their own way, and eventually we'll all get to the top, and God's going to be magnanimous, and he's, going to, he's just going to overlook everything and receive us into heaven. That's a lie from the devil. That's a lie from the devil. Jesus Christ never, ever said, I am an optional way to heaven. He never said, I am an alternative way to heaven. Jesus said, I am the exclusive way to heaven, because no man comes to the Father unless he comes by me. And this morning, friend, because God loves you, He has you here this morning, that you might hear that He loves you, and that you need to see, get saved. You need to be born again, and you need to become one of God's children. You see, Paul said to Timothy, there's only one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. He gave himself a ransom for its all. Peter says, there is no other name under heaven given amongst men whereby you must be saved. And the Lord Jesus Christ already, I've mentioned it, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except by me. If you're not here today, if you're here and you're not saved today, Jesus Christ is the mediator, and he's reaching out for you this morning and he's wanting to reconcile you to God, if only he'll come. What a wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Savior. The second thing he's doing as our high priest is a ministry now in relation to saints. A ministry in relation to saints. The first was a mediator in relation to sinners, and now he is an intercessor in relating to saints. He ever liveth to make intercession for us. Now, we've already seen many of the blessings that this intercessory ministry is to those of us who are saved. But to realize that there's a man in the glory, one who is touched with the feelings of our infirmities, one who understands our human weaknesses, my praise God today, he's praying for you wherever you are just now and whatever circumstance you're in. It's precious to know that whatever the pressures and problems of life may be, even when at times we don't know what way to do, what to do, and we don't know what way to turn, and we don't even know what we should pray for, how precious to remember that Jesus is praying for you, Christian friend. He's a ministry for saints. But he's a third ministry, and it is a ministry for sinning saints. He is an advocate for sinning saints. Now, we know that John tells us in his epistle that Christians ought not to sin. But unfortunately, we all have to admit that we do. We have still the old nature. The old flesh is lusting against the Spirit, and we do sin from time to time. And my dear friends, that is something which we, if you're truly saved, you'll know about. If you're truly saved and you step out of God's will, or you sin in God's, you'll know immediately. I'll tell you why, because the Holy Spirit's indwelling you. He's holy by name, He's holy by nature, and He's grieved when sin enters into your life. And you know when you've sinned, because you're troubled. The peace of God disappears, 
And we're told that we are to let the peace of God rule in our hearts and lives. That should be the governing factor. But John says, therefore, if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. You see, when a Christian sins, dear friends, there are two processes that will take place, one on earth and one in heaven. On the one hand, we become guilty of our sin, and we come to the place of confession, and we confess our sin. And if we confess our sin, we know that we shall be forgiven and cleansed. But when we confess our sin, you see, a progress begins in heaven. A process begins in heaven. And probably you're aware of this, but let me paint it this way. It's like a courtroom. It's like a courtroom, dear friends. And as you enter the courtroom, you are there, or I'm there in the dock, and I have sinned. And facing me at the other side of the courtroom is the accuser of the brethren, Satan himself. But standing beside me is my advocate, the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know, friends, as the bench is filled and God comes in, the Father enters, and Satan rises up, and with enthusiasm and with zeal he said, now listen, that man Crawford on such and such a day did such and such a thing, and it's a sin, and he ought to be condemned for it. And the accuser of the brethren exercises his ministry. Ah, but at that point, you see, my advocate rises. Now, in a human court, the advocate would say, well, Your Honor, there's mitigating circumstances. He's not as bad as you say you think he is, and the situation was so difficult, and it's everybody else's fault, and it's not his. That's what your advocate says in a human court. That's not what Jesus says. Jesus says, Father, this man Crawford has confessed his sin. He's guilty. He's guilty. But Father, he says, I have paid for it. I have paid for it. Do you know what the judgment is? There is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. My dear friends, if that doesn't energize us, if that doesn't motivate us to live holy lives and to have a better appreciation of Christ Jesus, our apostle and great high priest, I don't know what would. He has a ministry for you, sinner. He wants to save you. He has a ministry for you, Christian friend, this morning. He's praying for you. And if you're a sinning saint today, praise God. <laughs> dear, dear friend, you don't need to get saved again. No, no, if you confess your sin. He's faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And he's wanting today to have that that intimate relationship with every one of us. But we've got to put him in the right place in our lives. What a wonderful Savior. My, as we reflect in all this, is it any wonder Paul exhorts these people who are retarded in their Christian life? He says, now you just consider Christ. Salvation's just the beginning. He, he, he's also your high priest, and he's taken responsibility for you. And my, he's there as the advocate. When you step out of line, when you sin, confess it to him, and he'll sort it out with the Father. Isn't that a wonderful salvation? My dear friends, we want to be praising this morning. Don't come to church with long faces and feeling discouraged. We come with a sacrifice of praise upon our hearts that we, we today, are the children of God. And what a thrill it is to know that things that are ahead we can't even begin to conceive because there's greater ahead. The best is yet to be, and we are the recipients of God's grace. I trust the Lord will bless these thoughts, friends, to you, and that they'll be precious to you in the weeks that lie ahead, and that the Lord Jesus will bless all that we've said this morning. Let's turn to our green hymn books, please.